from truck drivers in Chile and South Korea to rail workers and nurses in the UK. Industrial unrest is spreading across large areas of the world. A global cost of living crisis is pushing workers to go on strike. So how can governments respond? And is this challenge too big for many? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Darin Abogeda. From Asia and Europe to Latin America, rising costs of living are leading to global unrest. Economies barely recovering from the pandemic are now facing more hardship. The war in Ukraine, a climate crisis and the price of food and fuel have pushed several countries beyond their ability to cope. The UN says the cost of living crisis is the worst the world has experienced so far in the 21st century. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, this report by Um Kalsoum Sharif. Farmers and truck drivers in Peru are feeling the impact of a war nearly 12,000 kilometers away. High fuel and fertilizer prices made worse by the war in Ukraine have pushed them into calling an indefinite strike. <laughs> A lot of produce meant to be on local market shelves isn't getting there. The government is already aware of our demands, such as the fuel issue, the reduction of tolls, the prohibition of entry into Peru of vehicles with foreign merchandise and fuel smuggling. In neighboring Chile, the situation is similar. 25,000 tons of cherries due for export to China stuck after striking drivers blocked access to a port. They are demanding a 30% reduction in diesel prices and more security when they are driving. In a country where 95% of cargo, including food and fuel, is transported by truck, the strike is paralyzing trade. After nearly a week of talks, the government is becoming impatient. We will not allow them to block the mobility routes of Chileans in our country. Therefore, we will apply the laws full force. Chile as a whole is facing a delicate economic situation and this is not the time for this type of activity to interrupt the course of our economy. In South Korea, a strike is disrupting exports from vehicles to petrochemicals. A work stoppage in June led to disruptions in production valued at more than $1 billion. Around the world, workers are demanding better pay and working conditions. And for the first time in the UK, nurses have called a strike in December. We haven't had a decent pay for over a decade now. Um, nurses work really hard, not just nurses, the NHS. Uh, we're all under pressure at the moment. Everyone's walking their heads off. Um, really, really difficult. So it's not just about clapping for us during the pandemic. Um, I think we need to be respected and appreciated for what we do. In many countries, a global cost of living crisis is leading to unrest. Sierra Leone's government imposed a curfew to stop protests. In Europe and other places, violence has become common between protesters and police. In Sri Lanka, an uprising that began in March ended with President Gotabaya Rajapaksha and his cabinet members resigning. In Lebanon, a crippling political and financial crisis has led to banks being raided. The UN says the crisis is pushing an additional 71 million people into poverty. And with few clear solutions, global protests like these are likely to continue. Umi Kulsum Sharif for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guest. Joining us from New York is Jordan Flowers, a lead organizer of the Amazon Labor Union and co-founder of the Congress of Essential Workers. 
In Shizuoka in Japan, Sadirio Takishita, a professor of the University of Shizuoka and a specialist in management and innovation. Joining us from London is Vicky Price, who's the chief economic advisor at the Centre for Economics and Business Research and a visiting professor at King's College London. Welcome to you all. Thanks for your time with us on Inside Story. Vicky Price in London, uh, the scale of all these strikes is quite unprecedented from South Korea to Chile to the US to the UK where you are. I mean, how would you describe the scale of this unrest? Oh, there's no doubt that we haven't seen anything like it in the sense that there are now nurses also going on strike, something we never assumed would happen. We've, we're seeing teachers voting to do so. We have uh, postal workers doing the same. And of course, the rail industry has been affected by strikes for quite some time now, which are going to increase in terms of numbers of days which are lost in uh, December. And they're now talking about continuing all this through the winter of 2023. Uh, Vicky, just one more for you before I bring in my guests from New York and Japan. I mean, over in the UK, there's, uh, there is a comparison uh, being made to, uh, of course, the infamous winter of discontent that was back in the 1970s when there was really a general sense of chaos that turned to political disaster effectively for, for the Labour government. Do you, uh, do you agree with that comparison? Is that where uh, things are heading? The same expression is used now again, I'm afraid, winter of discontent, but we have had a summer of discontent as well. So it's been lasting for quite some time. And the real worry is that we don't seem to be getting nearer to any solution. Uh, and one of the interesting things, of course, about what's happening now, which is slightly different to what was the case before, is that in, in that winter of discontent in the 70s, what we saw was that it was private sector workers who went on strike first, and they were quite unionized at the time, particularly the automotive industry, and then it spread to other sectors. And what we're seeing here is, of course, now that with unionization having declined in the private sector, whether unions are still strong is in public sector, so mostly in public services. So whether it's the rail unions or the postal workers or others. And that's the interesting thing, even though, of course, the Royal Mail, where the strikes are, post postmen not delivering, uh, letters is now privatized, but nevertheless, the unionization has stayed quite strong. So those are the areas where it's happening. Most, we're not seeing anything like that going on in the private sector at present. Okay, uh, Jordan Flowers over in New York, why do you think the strikes are happening now? Uh, it's holiday season, and a lot of workers are about to work 10 to 12 hours consecutively, maybe five days, six days straight. You know, these, these people have families, and uh, you know they need they need help with their kids, and they, they Amazon doesn't want to accommodate. So with all these strikes happening, you know corporations are make a, about to make a ton of money, and you know workers now are standing up to make that fight back. When you say Amazon doesn't want to accommodate them, um, tell us from your experience what you've seen. Uh, personally, I have lupus nephritis, and they've terminated me three times due to my health issue. Uh, no accommodations whatsoever. Uh, uh, recently, another employee who had uh, cancer terminated. Uh, it's easy to fire a, dis a, dis a disability worker at Amazon than firing a regular worker because they don't want to help with accommodations or leave. They'd rather not pay that and have workers stay out of work. They'd rather have the workers work inside the warehouses all year round and, you know, suffer. Seijiro, um, in Japan, what are you seeing in your region? I mean, the focus in the past few days, at least, has been uh, on South Korea. The South Korean president has warned that the government might actually have to uh, break up a nationwide strike that's taking place by truckers. How unprecedented is the situation there? Well, in Japan, we're not seeing any of this. Um, unfortunately, in Korea, we're, as you um, just reported, we're seeing quite a very serious state, uh, basically because, you know, Korean Confederation of Trade Unions are being extremely, um, well, excessively strong in, in their demand, um, as um, Vicky has put it. Um, unfortunately, I think um, this excessive leftist type of idea has been uh, really been pumped in by uh, the previous president, uh, Mr. Moon Jae-in. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I think this has really blown up. In addition to the macroeconomic environment that we're seeing, which is obviously, you know, fight over hegemony between uh, China and the United States, therefore truncation of our supply network, also because of Ukrainian invasion by Russia, uh, that's also putting a strain in the, uh, you know, um, 
supply chain network that we have. And of course, you know, uh, uh, the raw metal prices like oil are going up, uh, particularly the the inflationary fears, you know, that is basically ignited and, you know, making it very, very difficult for, you know, the individuals to live. And in case of Japan, we're about to experience this because it's also accommodated by weakening the yen. And we're probably one of the most vulnerable country in the world as far as introduction of, you know, energy is concerned because 99.9% of oil is imported. So, you know, we are about to see this, 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 I would say, pressure but in a totally different uh, way and uh, a method from that we're seeing from Korea. And when the president, uh, Saijiro, the South Korean president, that is, accuses the truckers of holding the national supply mm. chain hostage yeah. uh, during an economic crisis, mm. uh, are, are these comments helpful? Well, I think Mr. Yoon's comments um, are valid and uh, it's true. Um, back in the 70s in the UK as well, I think, you know, what people are doing uh, is shooting your own foot. But what you have to realize is that we're all in the same boat. And, you know, it's a Japanese saying, if you want to remedy your patient, don't kill it, you know. Um, but that's what, you know, um, KCTU is, is about to do. Uh, and I think, you know, the argument that's been displayed by the current president is totally valid because that's exactly, you know, what um, these people are trying to do, shooting your own foot at the end of the day. Um, Jordan, I'd like you to comment on uh, what Seijiro had to say, perhaps not on the South Korean situation itself, because you speak to us from, from New York, but when authorities uh, accuse workers of, uh, of uh, using a situation and, and, and holding uh, an industry hostage. What do you think of that? Uh, it, it's a good uh, holding the industry hostage is a good thing because you know again you know these work big corporations are taking over uh, and work workers like us that are standing on the picket line the front lines are you know dead on a daily basis and you know these corporations need to be held accountable for everything that's going on right now. Right and 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 do you believe that striking is uh, the correct way to hold them accountable? Definitely. What have you what, um, again, what have you seen that what have you seen that's worked from your end? Uh, so with us in our in our in our in our win in the New York, um, it was definitely uh, pick the picket line, sitting in front of the warehouse, talking to workers every day, feeding the workers, you know, actively engaging the workers, and you know that that's what building a community is, and you know that that's that that's what shows a lot of work and uh, has to be done. Vicky, it sounds like each of these strikes and, and union demands taking place um, in various countries across the world, they are kind of unique in their own ways, but there are some things that seem to tie them together as well. So there are some umbrella issues. What are the concrete changes uh, that you can see that strikers seem to be demanding? Well, certainly if you look at the UK, I mean, the interesting thing is that where the pressures are, as we discussed, they're mainly public services. And what you've seen is that the public sector workers have lagged hugely behind since COVID, but also earlier in terms of the increases in pay by comparison to the private sector. So what's going on right now in the UK? Of course, we had a bounce back, but we've also had very high inflation, which is over 11 percent. What you're finding is that private sector workers are getting pay rises on average, if you look year on year, of something like 6 percent, a little bit above that which is, of course, not sufficient to cover for inflation. But nevertheless, it's an increase of some sort. Public sector workers are stuck at around 2%. So the gap is really important. And what you find also is that there is a lot of resentment about this being the case, because, of course, we were all relying on those public services to keep us going through COVID, and hence why I mentioned it. And we were applauding the nurses and so on, um, because they were doing such a splendid job. What's happened now is that they feel they're not actually properly rewarded and they have lost out in real terms over a period of decades, not just the last couple of years. And that's really where the tension is. And the government, of course, uh, is arguing that there isn't enough money in the public sector, given that we have had to retrench quite significantly on the fiscal front. 
and prove that we are fiscally prudent. Um, we've had a number of upheavals in the markets recently in the UK that had to be remedied. So it's a very, very tight situation in terms of the ability of the government to respond to those demands. And uh, a lot of concern is therefore there that we may not reach a proper agreement and for a while, and therefore we're going to have those disruptions continuing for some time. Uh, and just one, uh, one more thing, Vicky, on, on the issue of public sentiment, because according to one poll that I was uh, reading, it found that 60 percent generally support workers taking industrial action and 33 percent of people were opposed. This is according to this poll. But then interestingly, uh, public opinion varies uh, depending on the group that's going on strike. So over in the UK, sympathy is high for nurses. You were just mentioning them a moment ago, but there is perhaps less understanding for railway workers and for council staff. That's according to recent polling. Why do you think that is? I think right now it's mainly because those new strikes are going to be happening around Christmas. They haven't uh, affected people too much before because we've now moved increasingly towards working from home. So when there is a rail strike, people just stay at home and use the computer and do so. But not everyone can do that. Uh, and as as we know, you know, you can't. Not everyone can work from home, and those who provide essential services have to be out there doing so. So it depends what to which group you ask, obviously. But right now, it is because of Christmas. We had lots of restrictions last year because we we're concerned about a new variant uh, of COVID, and uh, everyone was looking forward to having a proper Christmas this year. So I think it's slightly tainted by the season. Uh, because everyone wants to be able to go out and enjoy themselves. And I think that's why there's probably a little bit of resentment in relation to um, the rail workers. But it isn't, it isn't overwhelming by any means. So there is still a lot of sympathy around for that type of action. Uh, Jordan, over in New York, uh, what can you tell us about public sentiment there and whether the public supports uh, strike action that's taken, particularly in the run-up to the Christmas and the holiday period? Uh, definitely. Uh, we have a rally in two days uh, against Van Jones, uh, Andy Jossie, and uh, our mayor. Uh, it, it's a big thing, uh, again. Uh, so what are you hoping to achieve that, with this rally? Uh, that we get recognized. I mean, we won the, we won the, we won the election. We, almost, we got our certification. Now it's time for the bargaining contract. And we know that Amazon's going to take a while to, take a bar uh, to sit down with us. So all these rallies are just going to be leading up to our bargaining contract. Um, Sejiro, um, the Bank of England worries that if workers in the UK win big pay rises, then their employers will in turn have to put up prices for customers. That then pushes up yeah. inflation, causing workers to request yeah. uh, bigger pay rises, and it's a sort of never-ending cycle. It, it, do you agree with that argument? Well, you know, the nature of inflation in the UK and also in the US is demand Pool, uh, type, meaning that, you know, of course, there's a shortage of personnel or there's a lot of uh, uh, demand for pay rise, whereas in case of Japan, for example, it's cost push, so it's quite different. That's one of the reasons why our inflation rate is so much lower. Uh, I think, structurally speaking, you know, looking at the economic conditions, obviously, I think, you know, the Bank of England's worry is, I think, spot on uh, in the sense that, you know, it will cause the negative, you know, um, I should say, loop. Uh, that would, you know, exacerbate the current condition. Uh, also, it's also true that, you know, all central banks are trying to basically fight off inflation. And at the same time, they have to juggle with the mounting amount of debt, which had been, you know, accumulated during the COVID-19 crisis. At least Bank, Bank of England has a, a lot more room compared to, for example, Bank of Japan, who cannot make any maneuverability, in my opinion. So, um, yes, I think, you know, central banks are, you know, having a bit of a headache because they're facing a very direct dilemma. So what does the government of, what does the government, let's look at Japan for a moment. What does the government of Japan mm. do? Well, Japan, Bank of Japan um, really don't have the deep pocket, as people say, because obviously if you look at our debt level, it's, uh, you know, uh, the highest in the world. And also due to the fact that, you know, their current account has reached almost 600 trillion yen, meaning that if they do raise the rates, they really would be shooting their own foot. So obviously they can't afford to, you know, raise rates, even if we see, you know, uh, inflation that is coming about. Um, and eventually we will be, you know, getting affected. Right now, the inflation rate is very low in Japan, only 2 percentage. 
but you know uh, the the weakening the yen along with you know very high you know accommodative prices will be hitting us. So you know the the limited maneuverability by Bank of Japan will be hurting. You know we'll be seeing from early next year a lot of problems that will be rising. I think. Um, uh, Vicky, uh, the sheer number of strikes that are taking place right now in the UK, um, is that creating a sense of chaos for the government? And is the public going to be turning their attention to the government uh, so long as this continues and in this type of scale? Uh, they will and they already are. I mean, what we're seeing is that the opposition has retained a very substantial lead uh, in terms of the opinion polls over uh, the Conservative Party, so the Labour Party seems to be doing quite well. Um, although in any attempt to find out what they would be doing in terms of uh, perhaps agreeing to higher pay rises, we just don't know what the Labour Party will be able to do um, once and if they get in power in the next election. So yes, I think it's going to be a very testing time for the government. I mean, what we've got in the UK, of course, is we're having interest rates going up at the same time as uh, tax increases happening and a tightening generally uh, in both the, the monetary and fiscal stance and real disposable incomes falling at the highest uh, rates ever. Uh, I know there are other countries that are similarly affected, but what we're seeing in Europe, and I think there's going to be an increasing contrast, is that the European countries are not doing the same in the sense that, yes, interest rates are going up, but they are supporting quite significantly their households, a lot more than seems to be the case in the UK. And I think that's probably going to be a focus of attention in the months ahead. Uh, Jordan, uh, what happens if the strikes and the rallies that you're holding don't bring about the changes that you are demanding? Uh, it's to stay at the picket line, you know, we still we have to stay at the front door, you know, we're still going to be outside and we're still going to have to make noise and we still got to stay support the workers. So. Uh, Regardless, so we're always going to be out there making sure the workers are always safe and making sure that they're protected with their labor laws. How do you think these strikes, Jordan, affect people who aren't striking? And for those who aren't paying attention uh, to this situation, tell them why should they should be paying attention. Uh, it's their livelihood. I understand we're in a time of uh, recession and need and money. Uh, we just got over COVID. But uh, at the same time, it's still your life and your livelihood that... Uh, you know, they're, they're slaving you countless hours. They're slaving you day to night, uh, again, 10 to 12 hours. That, uh, you know, Amazon, Amazon's a corporation with, with no type of uh, regulated rules that, you know, Amazon plays by their own rule book. So they're allowed to change rules whenever they need to. And that's what people need to start seeing because, you know, th this is what affects them. And this is how they are able to keep a job or not. And, you know, that's, you know, a, a serious issue. Uh, Sejiro, who's in a stronger position here? Would you say the workers? I, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm coming off the back of Jordan. He's speaking about Amazon, but I'm just talking in generalities mm. and uh, what we see globally. So, are workers or employers in a stronger position here? Because uh, some people say, well, mm. workers are in a strong position because unemployment is now uh, relatively low in in some yeah. countries. Absolutely, absolutely. Again, you know, uh, countries which is suffering from demand pull situation in this inflationary. Fear, definitely, I think the workers have uh, a kind of an upper hand, I would say. Um, certainly not, you know, countries like Japan, um, which is, again, suffering from, you know, cost push inflation. So I think it differs quite considerably. And also, you know, depending on the structure of the authorities, for example, in case of Korea, which we first talked about, I mean, again, you know, their, their trade union has been pumped up with a, very much of a leftist kind of idealism. Um, which makes it, you know, very difficult for people to convince them to come into negotiation, for example. Uh, but, you know, in case of U.S., that's a totally different ballgame here. So, you know, I think it's, it's dangerous almost to basically give a conclusion. It depends really depending on the, the mm -hmm. macro background of each, each and every country. Right. OK, well, let's just finish off on South Korea then. Um, how do you think it's going to end up or play out? Well, I think this is going to be a very negative issue uh, because it's very difficult to change the ideology and minds, you know, that has been set um, during the days of, you know, um, uh, Mr. Moon Jae-in, uh, which has been, you know, again, exacerbated to an excessively leftist idea, which, in my opinion, is a danger to the capitalist idea, which is what, you know, Korea is about. So I think, um, you know, this is going to end up, unfortunately, in a very negative connotation 
possibly similar to you know what happened to the United Kingdom in late 70s and early 80s. Okay. On that note, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, uh, Jordan Flowers, Sejira Takashita, and Vicky Price. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. It's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is AJ Inside Story from myself and the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for watching and bye-bye for now.